Welcome back. This is your kind of well, kind of toxic host, Sarah Rittendale, bringing you another episode of Wellish. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy. Today's my Tuesday, technically, but happy okay. Monday for the rest of the world. I work, I work Sunday through Thursday. Okay. Right now, the goal okay. is to work Monday through Thursday. Mm, got it. Nice. It's well, nice running errands on Friday now. Yeah, I can absolutely, I can hear that. It's. I feel like Friday is the start of the weekend, and so you actually get to honor that instead of going to work like the rest of us on our weekend. <laughs> yeah, but while everybody else is sleeping on Sunday, I'm up at 6 a.m. working. Hey, fair. <laughs> Michael Cohan, welcome to Wellish. I am so honored to have you here today. I'm super excited to be here. So let's just have a great time and a great conversation. Amen. <laughs> Tell me, I like to let people introduce themselves. Tell me who you are, what you're about, what your whole life purpose is. Well, I am a you know a former corporate executive that used to live in New York City, working you know eighty to hundred hours a week, working for various real estate investment trusts who. At 30 years old, found himself divorced after six months of marriage, who went through a little bit of a crazy, crazy period of lots of money. So equals lots of toxic behavior. Mm -hmm. And then which led to me seeing a therapist who recommended me practicing yoga as a way to deal with my stress and anxiety mm -hmm. and my anger issues, which then triggered a spiritual and personal growth journey that I still am on today. At one point in my life, around 36, 37, I quit my job to become potentially a monk, realized that that path was not for me. It felt very suffocating for me. And so I decided to become a full-time yoga teacher where I met my wife, which led to the idea of, well, if I'm going to get married, how can I support us as a, you know, equal partner man? And I looked at my background. I was like, well, I have this master's in psychology. So let me go utilize that. And I went to get my coaching certification and then started running this online coaching business that I haven't looked back since. That's incredible. What a powerful storyline it sounds like that you kind of took this adversity that had happened to you and were like, I'm going to do something directly in line with that. I like that a lot. Is, yeah. your, is your coaching because of the adversity that you kind of went through? Like, is that the type of people that you are helping? Well, most of the people I see typically are between the ages of 35, 55, usually. I always have the outliers, sure. but that's usually the, the age gap. And they're typically spiritual, non-religious. Okay. They're at a crossroad in their life, whether it's career change, relationship issues, or they're just not finding fulfillment in their day-to-day -day life. And they're looking for someone to help give them life skills. Okay. My original plan when I was in college was to become a therapist 25 years ago. In order to become a therapist, you had to have a PhD. Mm -hmm. I really lost motivation uh, in around 2001 for personal reasons. And that's how I ended up in the city working a corporate job. I wasn't the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. I was the hardest working and the most ruthless. Mm. The pressure of New York City sometimes brings out the best in people. Mm -hmm. Art, culture, compassion. It brought out the worst in my nature. And so when I was 31 years old, like I said, 31, 32, and I got back into yoga, it reconnected back to my like real original roots of who I was as a person. Someone who wanted to make the world better, to help people, to live a life that's more spiritual. And mm -hmm. I just was so far away from it. Yeah. And when I went through that personal growth journey where I got into meditation and yoga, really exercised a lot of demons, I found myself at 38 years old teaching yoga. And I loved it. And I still love teaching yoga, but I was poor. I mean, broke. I mean, like... If I, I mean, and I was hustling, I would get up in the morning at, and have a private at 530 in the morning. I would put 50,000 miles on my car driving within 50, you know, a year of driving just in the state of New Jersey, teaching yoga. I'd get home at nine o'clock at night, exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I was just struggling financially. Mm -hmm. And so I just like sat down and I was like, what do I like about teaching yoga? 
And what I really liked about teaching yoga wasn't the physical practice. It was inspiring people to look at their lives and ask themselves, how can they live a better life and okay. give them those tools? And I said, well, how can I do that? Well, and I was like, I can do that through coaching. Sure. And that's led me to this, what I do now. Okay. Got it. So then when you are first starting with a client or even when you were just starting coaching, if someone was wanting to be, find their roots, like you were talking about, you did for yourself or aim for that higher life or like how you say aiming for that elevated life, what mm -hmm. would be the first skill you would teach them? <laughs> there is depends on the person. That's the hardest part of coaching. Sure. Um, when I started out this coaching business, I think a lot of people fall into this gap where you're told sell a package, right? That's how you build a coaching business. Sell a package, goal setting, time management, self-discovery, mindfulness, sell a package. And that's what I did. I would sell a package, see you for six months transforming your life. Mm -hmm. And I found along that way that most people have different needs based on different circumstances. So the root, the, the surface that everyone comes to with coaching is career change, goal setting, developing positive habits, relationship, communication. Great, that's all the surface. Mm -hmm. We wanna know what's going on down here beneath the surface. We wanna go below what you're trying to achieve to understand what is holding you back. Some people, it's as simple as learning how to communicate better so they have better boundaries. Mm -hmm. So then they have the time to be able to pursue their, their goals. Other people, it's understanding their emotional intelligence to be able to get realigned with how they feel. Some mm -hmm. people, it's about self-criticism where they're constantly beating themselves up so they can't take any chances or make any changes in their lives. Mm -hmm. And some people, it's about perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And then the list goes on, right? Yeah, so we don't sure. know until we start working. So as a life coach, what I do is I start really simple with classic coaching. Session one, what's your vision that you want to have when you're 70, 80, 90 years old? Session two is what habits do you want to establish as a baseline in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening? Session three, what's your theme for the year, your word? Session four, five, six, sometimes seven, is goal setting. What do you want to do in your life for the next year in terms of health, career professional, financial, and then miscellaneous goals? And then the final session is, where do you want to get done in, in five years? And that's really the nugget, the five years, not the one year. Because when I know what's going on in the five years, then I can be like, all right, this is the area of the, your life that we need to work on because of this vision that you want to be that you're out of alignment with today. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily correlate because I was going to ask you, does it, is it like a, you kind of unconsciously know what your issue is? Like, I know that I'm a perfectionist or something along those lines. And so I come to you and say like, this, this is something I struggle with, but it almost sounds like you're unpacking it from the later point and then coming backwards and being like, this is regardless of kind of what you have, and correct me if I'm wrong, regardless of what you think that you have an issue with, it not that it doesn't matter, but that in order to achieve X goal, you're going to have to accomplish emotional intelligence or something like that. Am I understanding that? Correct. So the biggest, so like people always ask this question, right? And I think it's in your email. It's like, how do I elevate my life? How do I level up, right? That's mm -hmm. like the thing that everybody always wants. Like, how do I level, level up? And I think the challenge is for our culture is leveling up is always about financial success or physical gain, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Lose weight. Well, look like you're 25 when you're 45. Yeah. Because when we go on watch TV, we see all these actors and actresses that are super thin, super fit. But we don't realize that the reason why they're that way is because they're on hormone therapy and they're getting surgery and they have the time to work out for two hours and their nutrition is managed. Their whole lives are a corporation. Yeah. Right. And so when I, someone asked me like, how do I elevate my life? It's not about success in terms of material gains. They will come regardless if you work on yourself. 
It's about asking yourself what it means for you to live your intentional life. As Ramit Sethi always says, it's like, what's your rich life today? And what's your rich life tomorrow? Like, I love that line. That yeah, he that's a good one. About. I haven't heard that. Yeah, that's his, that's his, that's not me. That's him. Okay. Right. So if you ask me what my rich life is, what my elevated life would be is to live in a three bedroom, two bath ranch house within a 20 minute drive of a really bumping downtown suburban urban area that has access to art, culture, music, and good, good vegetarian restaurants surrounded by like-minded people with access to, you know, natural nature activities on the weekends, additionally, mm -hmm. to have enough money to do whatever I want, at least once a quarter within reason, like go to a baseball game, go to a play, go to a sporting event, a concert, be able to take two good vacations a year. And then once a, once a year, pick somewhere cool to live and do what I'm doing, working anywhere in the world. That's my idea of an elevated life. I have no idea, no desire to drive a fancy car. Mm -hmm. Like I drive a Nissan Rogue. It's good enough for me. I have no <laughs> des right? And that's a nice car. Yeah, no absolutely. I'm, I'm not like, I need to get that Porsche. I need, right, I need the rolls. <laughs> yeah, doesn't, right. It doesn't even occur to me. Okay, I have an yeah. iWatch. I'm not like, oh, I need to get a Petit Philippe like, watch. I have an yeah. iWatch. I have a really expensive watch. I never wear it. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I never wear it. It just sits, it sits in a drawer yep. in a safe at my parents' house because I just have no desire to wear it. Mm -hmm. That's my idea of an elevated life. But at the same time, on the other side of the coin, what I said before we started this podcast, my idea of an elevated life, what I'm working towards is by 55 years old, I want to be making a half a million dollars a year to $300,000 a year, working four days a week, running an online coaching business through private coaching courses and a membership site. I want to then take that time that I have to work on myself through yoga meditation and connecting with my wife and my friends and my family mm -hmm. right that's my ideal life i'm not there right now but that's my vision and okay. every person has to have that vision because if you don't have, and the problem is what most people have is a vision that was instilled into them by their family mm -hmm. usually their parents sure their friends or what they see through the weapons of mass distraction so would you say that that's kind of the biggest reason people settle? Like what would be the difference between people that aim for the higher life and people that settle? <laughs> Trying to fit in. Oh, okay. Interesting. Right. Okay. So there's a book that was written in, I think, 1952 that every eighth grader in the United States reads for the most part, Lord of the Flies. I think everyone yeah, reads it yep. still, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Lord of the Flies was a critique on society. For sure. Basically, the theme of the book is we as humans are civilized by a thin thread due to society, rules of law. This has been disproven. As humans, we are group-oriented people. And this whole concept came out of World War II, and it's been studied for the last 50 years. Why do good people do horrible things, right? Mm -hmm. Why do people storm the Capitol? <laughs> why did why do people why do why do people riot in Washington? Like why do people do these awful things? Yeah, with good intentions. Yeah, because they want to belong to a group. So interesting. That's we're group we're group oriented. It's so How true. Do, yeah, right. It's so true. It, it's a sense of belonging. It's that human inert need <laughs> to belong somewhere that drives us so heavily it's so bizarre right and the weapons of mass distraction from 20 years ago when i was your age mm -hmm. right we thought they would be the greatest thing in the world and would reunite society facebook mm -hmm. it, twitter <laughs> instagram yeah right and at first it did like facebook was the greatest thing in the world when it first came out because i got to connect with my college and high school friends and reconnect to them and reestablish relationships because I got to see what they were doing and, oh, you're having a barbecue. Great. I'll come over. That was the yeah. whole point of social media. Now it's not. Now it, is now it has changed. slowly divided us into our little, tiny, little micro communities. Yeah. 
So we feel more and more isolated. Yeah. Now we want to grow as a person. So our tiny little group of friends that think like us, look like us, and act like us, right? It's our identity. And you look in the mirror and you go, you know what? I don't really like this person. Maybe I don't like my weight. Yeah. Maybe I don't like my job or I don't like where I live. Or yeah. I don't like my views of politics or religion. But if I go and change, the people in my community are going to attack me. They're going to tear me down mm -hmm. because I'm threatening the status quo. Mm -hmm. I'm threatening the group cohesion because we feel so isolated. Yeah. And so in order to grow, this is the hard part, in order to grow, in order to change, you're going to have to shed part of your group mindset. Yeah. And you have to become a change person, a change mindset. Right? There's three types of relationships we have in this world. We have permanent relationships, temporary relationships, and change relationships. Permanent relationships are the people that we were born with, our parents, siblings, relatives, right? We don't always have to have a good, be close with them, but those are people that, we, no, yeah. I mean, that's the part of the problem is people who have toxic permanent relationships with people to, who do not serve them don't have boundaries right yeah holidays and birthdays right i you know like sometimes i say like you know sometimes families like fish right it's good when you it's good for a day it's okay after the second day but after the third day it starts to smell mm -hmm. and if you have it for too long it goes it goes bad yes right? <laughs> absolutely and some people struggle with that yeah then you have your temporary friends and relationships these are the people that you were born with these are the people in your community who you went to high school with college you work with a lot of times we identify temporary relationships as our like lifelong friends, mm -hmm. but they're not. Because if you moved across the country or you switched careers, you'd probably never see them again. Yep. But in order for you to grow as a person, you need to be able to shed those temporary relationships. And you have to create boundaries around those permanent relationships who don't necessarily are going to support your growth. Mm -hmm. Become that change person. And a change relationship is someone who's like, hey, I want to start a podcast. And your change friend would be like, great, go start a podcast. Mm -hmm. Or I want to go move to Norway and start a backpacking business. Great, go do that. Yeah. Or I, I found yoga or meditation or this faith. And your change friend does not feel threatened by what you want to do. And it's going, yeah, because they identify not with their community, not with their friends, but they identify themselves with who they are at their core. Yes. And when we go to that core identity of who we are, then we're able to change. Okay. And we're able to grow. And you think become that change friend, not seek those change friends. Yeah. Change friends are very rare. I have two. I've been, I'm very lucky that say. I have two change friends in my life. Yeah. My one best friend from college and one friend I made in, a, in my adult life. Okay. Anytime I'm, I'm trying something new or trying out something, both of them are like, go for it. Awesome. Yeah. Tell me how it is. Mm -hmm. Ch champions and vice versa. Biggest champions. My, my wife is, is a change partner. Sure. Right. Constantly into personal growth. Introspection. Mm-hmm. The hard part is to become that person can become very lonely for a little while because, mm -hmm. you know, you like we'll use the classic example of, of like weight loss, right? The biggest problem of weight loss is, you know, in order to exercise, you got to say no to certain things like going to the bar on a Thursday and watching, uh, watching your favorite sporting match, drinking beers and eating buffalo wings. Totally. Right. And I, I had a friend that did this to me once. Right. I remember when I was like 33 years old and I was on this, my journey and I was losing weight and I was exercising. I was meditating. I had a friend that says, said this to me and people say this to everyone. You're no fun anymore. Yeah. All yeah, you want to do is like go to the gym and exercise. You don't drink it anymore. Yep. You don't want. All right. That's the hardest part is because in order to change. We have to let go of the friends and family that does not serve our vision. 
-hmm. But in order to do that, we have to accept a certain period of loneliness, mm -hmm. which is part of that hero's journey. And in order to become the person that we want to be, and then when we become that person, then a new group of people will surround us. And how does that happen? Do you think that that's because you're putting yourself in situations that you are around like-minded people, the more that you kind of figure out who you are and put intention towards creating that life for yourself? Like, how mm -hmm. do you escape that lonely period? Part of it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you just have to accept it. I mean, that's that you, there are very few people who don't go through that lonely period in life. Mm -hmm. Unless they were always born with that mindset of personal growth and development. Like yeah. Those people, are, those people are lucky. I had a friend that in the city like 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, for whatever reason, he was just not interested in the drama that you and I go through and the struggles. Mm -hmm. And he knew exactly who he was and knew exactly what he wanted to do for a living and knew exactly um, who he wanted to be with since he was like nine years old. Mm -hmm. So by the time he was 25 years old, he met his, he was married and his wife's sister was married his best friend. Mm. And they're still together 25 years later, the wow. four of them, and they're still happy and living their lives. They're, they just weren't interested in everything else that we all go through. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, their family was very supportive of their journey. People they were born into, their parents were extremely uh, supportive of their journey that they were going on and so completely caring. Most of us don't have that. No. Yeah. Right. Most of us don't have parents that are like, oh, you want to go be a Buddhist? Great. You want to go be a Christian? Great. You want to go be a doctor? Great. You want to go be a yoga teacher? Great. Yeah. Whatever it is you want to do, great. Yeah. Most of us have parents that have pre-constructed views of who we were supposed to be mm -hmm. and how we're supposed to live our lives. Mm -hmm. And that construct creates the life that we think we're supposed to have. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Yeah. Right. But if we're not happy mm -hmm. and we have to go on that journey of growth, which is lonely. Okay. Because if you do the work, you work hard, eventually, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 30 years from now, you'll finally get to a place where you feel fulfillment. Right. And that's the goal. Because if that's the reason you're not happy, like those people that you were just describing, like they were happy with that life. And that's great. Good for them. But right. that's not something like, like you and I that fulfills us. And so- it's worth it to go through that lonely period, in my opinion, because at the end of the day, those people and being surrounded by people that aren't aren't changed people that aren't getting me where I want to be, that aren't putting me in the correct mindset. It's not worth it. And to be right. 80 years old and be like, OK, cool. I was friends with Lisa for 13 years, but <laughs> now I don't live a life that I want to live. <laughs> it's like what's and the every point? Every time I decided to start a business, podcast, mm -hmm. a, a retail business, she tore me down. Yeah, right. I, right. Because right. she felt threatened. Right. Exactly. What? So what are the best practices, do you think, to not ignore the things about yourself that you're too afraid to address? Like how we were talking about those emotional intelligence things and the perfectionism. So when you sit down with a client and you say, okay, this is what it sounds like we need to work towards, I feel like that can be kind of terrifying. So what would you say would be some walls that people need to break down in order to start working towards them? Okay. So let's just start with the premises of this. You and I both have two lists. We have a list of things at the top of our the header says everything I like about my life, who I am as a person, how I look in the mirror, my friends, my family, my career, my life, my financial situation. Then we have another list and says everything in my life that I don't like about myself, who I am as a person, what I look like in the mirror, my <laughs> friends, my family, my financial situation, my career. We all have these two lists. The goal in life isn't to look at the list of things that we like about our life and say, this is everything, I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be all the time. Mm -hmm. You're not, mm -hmm. right? 
And we're not supposed to look at the list of things that we don't like about ourselves and say, oh, these are problems that have to go away because if they go away, I'll finally find happiness. Yep. Because that's not going to happen either. Every person in this world, by and large, unless you're part of an outlier, so let's define outlier. You live in an inner city and you're in object poverty, or you live in a part of the world of object poverty, or you live in a culture where you're not able to be free to express yourself, or you've had major uh, trauma in your life due to, you know, sexual assault, violence, right? Those are the, those are the, those, those people, that's, that's where therapy comes in and that sure. should be addressed. But ex excluding those individuals that have real serious issues that were not due to their own making, mm -hmm. most of us have these two lists. Those that suffer think that their list of things that they don't like about themselves is really big. And the things that they like about themselves is really small. Yeah. And they think everybody has a bigger good list and everybody else has a smaller bad list. Yes. We have the same list. Yes. You as an individual are unique. Mm -hmm. You, your problems are not. They're universal. Yep. Right. So let's establish as that at the baseline. We have our two lists. So the goal in life is not to look at your bad list as a problem, but an opportunity to grow, to be a better person, to look at that as your teacher, mm -hmm. to inspire you to learn more about who you are as a person. And the good list is the place where we're supposed to have gratitude, growth, gratitude, which is why every time I ask a client before in the beginning of every coaching session, I always ask the client is what is one thing that you're doing well? What is one opportunity for growth? It's to be able to look at both of those things, whether it's the good and the bad, as the same, right? It's to be able to look at gold and mud as equal in value. Not to say, oh, this is better than this, but both there for a purpose. So we okay. establish that baseline, okay. right? The good list and the bad list aren't evil and good and where I want to be and where I don't want to be, but both are there for a purpose for both personal growth and gratitude. Great. Second thing, the goal in life is not to be happy. Happiness is an emotion. The goal in life is not to be sad. Sad is emotion. The goal in life is to understand the emotion that you're experiencing, to correctly label that emotion, uh, and then use that emotion to guide your thinking so you respond with the best possible outcome. Problem is, most people don't have that emotional intelligence because that's considered high emotional intelligence. Yeah. So it's, I feel a certain way, therefore I react, right? right. Common example. Oh, it's Monday. Mm -hmm. Right? Sad. I have to go to work. Yeah. Oh, it's Friday. Joy. I got to go out <laughs> and spend money. Right? Yes. That's you reacting to the experience instead of going, oh, wow, it's Monday. I get to go into work. I might mm -hmm. not love my job. Because who told you how to love your job? It's called work. Yeah. Right? You're not supposed to love your job. It's not supposed to be like this passion. Mm -hmm. Work is work. You're supposed to earn a living. Yes. You're supposed to find fulfillment through your life. Okay. So you wake up in the morning on Monday and go, oh, I got to go to work. I'd rather be at home with my family and friends. But this gives me the ability to go out and do things. So I look at my job as, as personal growth as an opportunity to earn a living. Interesting. Okay. Right? I like that. I like that mindset shift a lot. Because Too many people think like, oh, I, I don't have the great job that everybody has on social media, hashtag influencer, hashtag <laughs> living my best life. And there's yeah. something wrong with me. Yeah. You're every, it's like, or the other mindset that I constantly have to fight with certain friends about. You do not need to quit your job to be successful in life or happy. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with your job and the income that you earn will determine whether you're success, success, successful or not. I know so many entrepreneurs that make half a million, million dollars a year and live paycheck to paycheck. Yep. I know I have friends that make $70,000 a year and they're, getting ready to retire at 50. Yeah. It's not what you do for a living. It's what you do with it. That's awesome. Okay. Right. 
Yeah. I remember it kind of makes me think. I remember one time I was a senior in college and I went to Miami with my friends for spring break. And I remember standing in the ocean and kind of, you know how like Miami just like looks pretty. It's got the pink colored buildings. I'm standing in the ocean. It's warm outside. And it's almost like this like ideal kind of like that vacation lifestyle that people try to achieve or whatever. And I remember thinking as, again, I'm ending college here and I'm on the verge of having to come up with a career and start that journey, mm -hmm. thinking what's more important to me, where I live and the kind of life that I'm living or the career? Because in a sense, you almost have to choose because the people that it sounds like that do have the career that's their passion, that's their whole life. And they spend their whole time building that career and enjoying that because they love it so much and because that's what makes them feel fulfilled. But the people that kind of want to live their life and enjoy their friends and be able to spend their money and find fulfillment out of their life, like um, like you were saying, it's like you can't really put all that intention towards the career. Most people in this world are not going to live their passion career and they're not supposed to yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that that goes back to this idea that if you have a problem mm -hmm. something's wrong with you if you're not in the most exciting career making millions of dollars a year driving a fancy car and flying on a private jet that somehow you're a failure mm -hmm. right and it's just like these are all these things. Now, there's nothing wrong with not having nice things. I'm drinking at a next mug, right? I don't know if you know it. I'm drinking my coffee out of a next mug. This is a mm -hmm. nice, fancy, expensive mug. I mm -hmm. love it, right? <laughs> but if I didn't have it, I wouldn't care either. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have it because it keeps my coffee warm and my tea warm. Mm -hmm. And I'm coaching all day. So I was like, I'm going it, to, it's worth it for me. Yeah. But if I sure. didn't have it, I'd still survive and be happy. Right. Because things that I have don't define me. Yes. The thing I do for a living does not define me. Mm -hmm. What defines me is who I am as a person, mm -hmm. how I wake up in the morning, how I think all day long, and how I react to those experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can control. That's our free will. Yeah. Our free will is not anything more than how I think, how I feel, and how I respond to a situation. For sure. And so when we wake up in the morning and we go, okay. I have a list of things that I don't like about my life that I can improve upon. And I have a list of things I like, I can live in gratitude and my life isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then life begins to get easier. Okay. So then let me ask you the big question of what do you think the biggest factor is in finding yourself? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't found myself yet. <laughs> okay. See, good answer. It's a it's a journey. Like that's yeah. the, everybody, you know, I get this all the time. It's like, if I just get over this hill, all my problems will go away. If I just get this promotion, if I just meet the right person, everything will be easy. Mm -hmm. It's not about the destination, right? It's like, Amen. It, right. It's the journey essence mm -hmm. of Bhagavad Gita teachings, right? You can buy a plane ticket to London. You can choose what you're going to pack. You can choose what time you're going to leave within reason. Once you board that plane and you sit down, you're going to London. Yeah, right. Like, that's out of control. So then what do you do? You can control what you do on the plane, mm -hmm. right? But you can't control anything else. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for me, I, I, you know, like, and I feel like I'm an old person these days saying this. I'm like, you whippersnappers. But it, <laughs> like, I look around and I feel like the biggest problem right now is this a lack of culture and what i mean by that is this it's like you go out to dinner reasonable dinner it doesn't have to be like a thousand dollar michelin restaurant but like a decent dinner and i look around it could be olive garden it could be a nice bistro it's just you're going out to dinner and i look around and i see people in flip-flops Mm -hmm. tank tops and shorts mm -hmm. and you're at dinner mm -hmm. it's not special then yep dinner yes right? get on a plane and i'm flying somewhere and people are wearing their pajamas yep their indoor clothes yeah like, that's your indoor clothes like i'm not judging people wear athleisure because you wear athleisure to the gym yeah you're wearing your hello kitty jumper <laughs> with your neck pillow 
and socks and flip flops to board a plane that I yes. have to sit next to. Flying used to be fancy. You have you used to have to dress up to get on a plane. They wouldn't let you on the plane looking like that before. Right. Or you're at a and you know you're or you're you're at a beach bar and you know you take your hat off. There's a sort of a there seems to be I think the big struggle right now that a lot of people have is there's a lack of civility and manners. Okay. Right? To be kind, mm -hmm. to to be intentional. Like I'm gonna go leave the house. I'm gonna go out to dinner. I'm gonna be intentional about it. I'm gonna yeah. get put on a pair of shorts or put on a pair of jeans and a button down shirt and a pair of shoes to go out to dinner because I'm going to make it intentional. I'm not yes. just going to do it and rolling out of bed. Yes. I'm, when I'm in line at the grocery store, I'm going to be polite to the person around me. I'm not going to look at the person checking me. I'm like, you peasant checking me out at the grocery <laughs> store. Like, how yeah. dare you not know how much those apples are and it's all your fault that they're six dollars because you're the lonely checkout person who has yes. no power. So let yes. me pick on you. Yes. Right. It's this like when we live an intentional life, we ask ourselves this question: How can I be kinder? How can I present myself in a way that shows myself, like with culture and with class? And mm -hmm. we've really moved away from that because it's all about like. How many likes you can get on Instagram? How many TikTok videos you can have? How many, mm -hmm. how great your life is? Mm -hmm. Which is why I don't do social media anymore. I got, I'm like, I, I cut, I'm like, as a life coach, trying to yeah. teach people to be intentional. I was like, I have no business on social media then. Yeah. Interesting. I love, I was going to ask you about the intentionality because I think that something that isn't talked about enough is these like minor things that we can do as individuals to be intentional, like going to dinner and looking nice. And it's right. like, you don't, you think when you think of intention, you think like, okay, so I have this life goal to become a CEO. And so what are the things, these big milestone things that I'm going to do in order to be intentional, but you don't think about like, okay, but you have to be intentional every day with your morning routine. You have to be intentional with the way that you dress every day or like all of these examples connecting you with mentioned. your wife being right. kind kind to your neighbor be asking yourself this question am i making the world better yeah. or worse yes. right like the simple act of you're out to dinner i don't know you mm -hmm. and you're sitting you know you know an arm's length away and you're watching a youtube video while i'm trying to eat dinner and have a conversation with my wife like, mm -hmm. where is the mindfulness? Where yes. is the intention? Yes. Why do I need to hear your YouTube video that I have no desire to see in mm -hmm. a public place? Mm -hmm. And we've gotten to this place where we want our inside life to be our outside life, mm -hmm. right? Hence why people wear pajamas outside now. I'm like, this is the outside world, not the inside <laughs> world. This yes. is how you present yourself. Yes. It's how you live your life. Right. Yes. We, 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 we hear what we see. So if we go out in the world and we present ourselves with, with, with manners and we present ourselves with, you know, integrity and we dress with integrity and we hold ourselves integrity and we're kind to people, then the world around us becomes kind yes. and the world around us becomes cultured. It's yes. this, there's, there's this too much of what's in it for me <laughs> because, mm -hmm. if I, cause that's the only way to get ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's true. You can do that. You can, you can, you can push your way, fight your way, argue your way, push down your way, and you'll get ahead. And that's great. But who will you be as a person? Yeah. Right. They say that like, and if you're saying like, push yourself forward financially too, they say that the people that you're just, the richer you are, you just have a bigger microphone. And you're still the same person. So if you were an asshole down here and but you become rich, you're still gonna be that way. Or if you're a good person, you're gonna be that way too with you have money. If you have a lot of money or you're really poor, who you are as a person becomes amplified. Yes. If you're kind and jealous generous when you're wealthy, you're gonna be more kind and more generous. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're if you're intentional in your living, you're gonna be more intentional. Right. Either way problem we have, and this goes back to the continued theme, the majority of people out there that are successful, 
whether you know they're senior vice presidents of a corporation or they work really hard in their you know you know blue collar job making you know fifty thousand dollars a year, but they intentionally save their money to do something with it and become successful one way or another. Mm-hmm. The majority of those people live quiet lives. Mm-hmm. They don't have a need to be famous because yeah. they're busy living yeah. their lives. The problem we have is the people that are loud and obnoxious get all the intention. Mm-hmm. And so like my goal as a life coach is to pe- teach people that that's not the way because it's not going to lead to you being happy. What's yeah. going to lead you to find that happiness, that fleeting emotion is to wake up every day and say, how can I be successful in my career, my endeavor, whatever I'm trying to pursue without sacrificing my mental health my emotional health, my relationship with my partner, my friends, and my community and the people I work with. Because Mm -hmm. once you sacrifice those six things, that end result's never going to be enough. You're always going to want the next thing and you're always going to get more and more miserable. Mm -hmm. I know people that are really successful, that are really happy with their lives because they didn't sacrifice those six things. And I know people that are really successful with their lives that put all that stuff on the side and hate their lives, Yeah, which is why they come to me for coaching. Because no one, when they're dying, says to themselves, I wish I made more money. I wish I was a bigger asshole. I wish I was, I, I wish I, I, you know, stepped on more people's toes and conquered the world. They say, Mm -hmm. I wish I loved more. I wish I spent more time with my friends or my family or traveled or took chances. Mm -hmm. So if we know that, why do we constantly try to think that we have to like push pride and fight for something that we're not going to care about when we're 80 years old, 90? Right. Absolutely. So that kind of leads me into what is or what does toxic self-help look like? All right. Toxic self-help reminds me of the of the yogurt journal cover every month. I see it when I'm checking out at the grocery store. It's some person who's 35 to 55 years old, super skinny, body's airbrushed, sitting in some like ridiculously amazing place and saying, my life is beautiful because I look this way. I buy these things and I live this per- this life. Toxic yeah. self-help is simply put. It's somebody trying to sell you something saying that there's something wrong with you unless you buy this course, take this pill, buy this book, or take this action. There is nothing wrong with you. And anybody who says there is should go F themselves. Yeah. You are a unique person. When when you think there's something wrong with you and you're constantly trying to pursue that which you think is wrong, it becomes toxic. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's to try to find that ideal false image. Mm -hmm. True personal growth is simply just this reoccurring theme that we've been on through the show is I wake up every day with intention. I Mm -hmm. ask myself this question. How can I live my best life today? Mm -hmm. How can I work on myself? Now, I might have problems like I might have money issues or I might have problems with my marriage or my kids, Mm -hmm. or my mother or father is getting old and sick, or I'm losing my job. We Mm -hmm. all have problems in life. Toxic positivity is about ignoring those things. Also known as spiritual bypassing, saying these things are wrong and I should get rid of them. Growth and development is like, okay, here's a problem. How can I make it better? Okay. What can I do to be a better person? Yeah. And not think there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. So focusing on the gain and not what you need to get rid of. Focusing on being, looking at your life and seeing the things that you have with gratitude. Okay. And looking at the areas of your life that you're struggling with and saying, okay, what do I need to learn? Who do I need to, how do I need to grow Mm -hmm. to, in order for that to no longer be my obstacle? Because as soon as you fix one thing, going to be another thing to fix yeah so it's not totally. about fixing it's yeah. about growing yes absolutely you talk about intentional laziness can you tell me <laughs> about that because I feel like this is going to be something that takes a really huge weight off of my like workaholic shoulders <laughs> so I want to know about it <laughs> I'm I, I'm a machine I'm a machine right what I mean by that is 
my day, my work day today will end at 7.30, 8 o'clock tonight mm -hmm. without blinking an eye. I will work 10 to 12 hours. Yeah, that's how I am. Right. I, that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> People right. yell at me for that, so that's why. I'm no, no, I mean it's okay. I'm, I mean, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not at this. Look, my goal isn't to always be like that. My goal yeah, right. is not. My goal. I'm 46. My goal of 47, 46, 47. I forget. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really like I, I, like I, I, I just I'm, I'm ten and ten and a half years older than my wife, and I think my wife and I said it. She's like, I don't know how old I am. I'm like, I don't either. <laughs> Like, I only not know really... because my sister's on the year, and if it wasn't for that, I'd be screwed. <laughs> I well, like I try to wake up every day and not let the old man in, right? <laughs> I try to wake up every day and not be like, oh, I'm getting old. Like I'm definitely slowing down in a lot of senses. Like I don't like a late night for me is eleven o'clock, mm -hmm. right? Like that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, and I lost track track of my conversation. Intentional laziness. Okay, I work 10, 11, 12 hours a day. My goal is not to be like that in, in five years. My goal in the f next five years to, is to work more nine to five so I can have more free time for me to do things like go to a yoga class, mm -hmm. take, take guitar lessons, jump on an online conference or travel and go to conferences or vacations. What intentional laziness is this? It's simply put, when I'm tired, I don't work. Right. If I'm working all week long as a solopreneur and and Thursday hit at noon and I hit the wall, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I got to get this podcast done or I got to get this video done. I don't do it because I'm hitting the wall and I acknowledge mm -hmm. that I've gotten as far as I can and I shut down. I ask myself every day, what do I need to do to rest and recharge? The biggest challenge solopreneurs have is they constantly work, you know, because you get it. It's the grind. You got to get the hustle. You got to get the grind. Right, right. Fuck that. Amen. Right? Like, if you're tired, be tired. God, that a makes me feel so good. Take a vacation. I never work on Saturdays. Same. I refuse yeah. to work on Saturdays. Same. I don't care what's going on Sunday. I won't work on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I work five and a half days a week at times. Mm-hmm. But when I'm not working, I'm not working. Yeah. Right. My yeah. my work phone. That's why I have two cell phones. I, I have two cell phones. It's my work cell phone and I have a personal phone. I just have an old iPhone seven as my work phone, mm -hmm. and then I have like my iPhone eleven, which probably by now people are like, "You have an iPhone eleven? So dated." I'm like, <laughs> no, it's at this point there's too many. <laughs> so, it still works. Amen. And like, I, and I'm not like a big gamer on my phone, so yeah, right. You know, so <laughs> that's what it has to right it, it, it has gps <laughs> <laughs> i i that is me like to a t that like so you say you don't work on saturdays i this literal what two days ago yes two yeah this last saturday i felt that way that i was like i knew i had stuff that i needed to get done but i was like i don't feel like doing it and then i said to myself i deserve a day off once a week like it at least at least and two ideally yeah three, right perfect right. I, three is the dream yeah amen <laughs> but so i but i would like even if i wasn't working all day long like i would still say okay it's saturday night and i'm not doing anything because i'm sitting on my couch and so now that means that i got to do something else because really i have other things that i need to get done and it's like that's not how it works so i was like okay i deserve to have this day off and i'm gonna commit to that that saturdays I'm just not going to do anything. But typically, even during the week, like how you say on like Thursday, you hit a wall, very common for me to hit a wall on Thursday. So I relate it to that is that I hit that wall. And then I say, well, it's Thursday, though, like, I don't have a choice, like, I still have to get stuff done. And so I, I and even if I do take a step back and say, like, okay, I'm just going to turn something on and relax for a second, I will. Um, I'll beat myself up for it, that the whole time I'm like, like you suck like you're lazy you're gonna make your life harder in the future like why are you doing it for this long so i too definitely too many pot toxic personal coaching yeah right too many people on a microphone saying to you 
you gotta quit your yes. job and jump all in bullshit 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 yes. you gotta hustle to be successful bullshit 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 dude mm-hmm. i have some i i have some really really massively successful friends they worked their they there was a period where they worked really hard within mm-hmm. reason mm-hmm. they don't anymore they, they get up at like they get up at nine they work till five yeah right like you you the goal is to get to a place where you no longer have to be working 10 hours 11 hours a day that's mm-hmm. the goal mm-hmm. and if that's not your goal you're gonna burn out or you're missing out on the rest of your life mm-hmm. and it's this you there's that it goes back to that weapon of mass distraction it's that demon that is constantly telling you that you know if you're not working 24 7 then you're failing look America's America. What makes America so wonderful is that we don't have a autocracy. We don't have we we don't have that much generational wealth. I think it's what three generation. It, you know, the wealth that someone acquires lasts typically three generations in America. Mm-hmm. And after the third generation, it's gone unless mm-hmm. that person that 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 third generation person continues to grow and build it. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of changing of money in America, of people going up and people going down, which gives every individual the opportunity to really do something with their lives, to really create something wonderful in this country. Yeah. At the same time, because we don't have a lot of social safety nets, we don't have a government mandated pension like they do in Europe. We don't have um, necessarily the best universal health care system. We don't have certain social safety nets. We live in this constant state of fear, right? And because of that, that that leads to this this state of overwhelm where we're frantically working. And we'll work too much. And then instead of doing what we're supposed to do is taking a portion of that money and saving it for retirement and a rainy day, we justify that overworking by buying shit we do not need. And that repeats that cycle of overwhelm. Mm -hmm. Intentional laziness goes with intentional everything. It's like, what do I need in this world to find happiness? Mm -hmm. What do I want? And then how can I get it with intention? So if you want a night, like if you want to, like I had a client ask me once, they wanted to buy a new car and they were like, well, what do you think I should buy? It's like, well, what do you want? He yeah. was like, and the client was like, I want a fully loaded Saab something. He mm-hmm. likes Saabs, right? It was a $60,000 car. I was like, okay, so very, that's a $60,000 car. How much money do you make a year? $150,000. I was like, well, then that's not the right car for you because you make $150,000 a year. Why not? I'm like, because your car payment is going to be 20% of your income. Yeah, right. Right? Every month. That, yeah. Right? And because of that, you're not going to be able to save money for a house, mm-hmm. for retirement, mm-hmm. for a vacation. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to constantly be in the state of trying to pay for everything. And so then when you want to take a day off from work or slow down a little bit, you're not going to because you're going to be afraid you're going to lose your job. Yeah. Right. What do you think is a good way? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said intentional me. laziness is living within your financial means, having your rich life today without mm-hmm. sacrificing your rich life tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Because th- you know what? You just answered my question. I was going to say, what is how do you kind of, I feel like we live in this state of like, want, 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 like, oh, I want that car. I want the sub. That's going to make me happy. I'm going to be able to drive that to work every day. Who cares that it's 20% of my income, whatever. I'll justify it, but right, it doesn't. So how do you kind of remove yourself from that mindset? But it sounds like that's how with the intentional it's, laziness. It's part of the human condition. Okay. You're naked in the woods. Yeah. It's snowing outside. You're cold and you're hungry. You're miserable. You walk through the woods and you come to a cabin and you knock on the door and you go, sir, I'm naked in the woods. I'm hungry. Let me in. Person opens the door and says, oh my God, you're naked. You must be hungry. <laughs> come inside. Sit by my fire. Here's a blanket and here's a bowl of stew. 
right? That little bit of change made us so much better. Yeah. So we go, wow, a little bit of change made me feel better. I, I now have clothes, I have a blanket, I have food, I'm no longer hungry, I have shelter, and I'm warm. So mm-hmm. if that makes me a little bit of happiness, if I just get more of it, I'm going to be even happier. So we keep chasing that. Yeah. Right. And we keep wanting those things. Yeah. Right. There's nothing wrong with buying a nice car. There's nothing wrong with living in a nice house. As long as it doesn't sacrifice your ability to live a quality life. Mm -hmm. So if you make a half a million dollars a year, yeah, you're lucky. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And then you, and, and you don't have crushing student loan debt and you, your kid, and you can afford that car and it's not 20% of your income, right? Because it's a need, it's a want. Right? Yeah. It's not a need, right? Mm-hmm. Because your your want should only take up 30% of your income. Your needs should only take up 50% of your income. And then 20% you should be able to save. Yes. So if you can do that, great. If you can't, then you can't do it. You don't need it. It's not going to make you happier if you're driving a fully loaded car versus a uh, versus a standard baseline car isn't going to make that much of a difference but we think wow if i get this you know like oh, i was looking for a new car in february mm-hmm. my car had 250,000 miles on it mm-hmm. and it needed new tires new brakes and it had an emoji check engine light came on <laughs> yeah. and i was like all right well it's time to buy a new car because probably the money to fix this car is going to cost as much for the down right. payment and I work full time from home, so I don't have a commute. So I didn't really buy a car wasn't a priority. I was I drive five thousand miles a year, mm-hmm. and so I was looking for cars. And I was like, all right. And I was just gonna get a you know a basic Nissan. And my wife was like, you work hard. We have the money. Mm-hmm. Go buy yourself a decent car. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'll go buy a decent car. It's not really something I care about, mm-hmm. right? And so I looked at Nissans and I was like, okay, I drove, test drove the SV and I test drove the S. The S is the base model. It has Apple CarPlay and that's, and that's it, right? Mm-hmm. And the SV had leather seats. They were heated. It had, you know, the, the seat went back and forth. They had driver's assist. I can put it on an auto drive. All these bells and whistles. All the things, yeah. All the things. Great. Neither of them were going to make a difference for me. So why buy the most expensive car in that model? Yeah. And you think that's you personally? Like, obviously, because some people that does matter too. It depends on the person. It depends on your life. It depends on what you value. That's the problem. It's like if you value a really fully loaded car or a really expensive vacation, Mm -hmm. great. You just don't do it without being smart about it. Yeah, you right. Say, okay, that's what I want. I want that really nice, fully loaded car that's going to cost $50,000. Mm-hmm. Well, in order for me to be able to handle the monthly car payment, because fuck Dave Ramsey and the live debt free thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Most people can't buy a car without having a car loan. I bought a 2020 Nissan Rogue with 20,000 miles on it, and it was $20,000. Yep. Mm -hmm. right i'm gonna have a car loan in this day and age cars are no longer you know when i was 25 years old i got i graduated from college and i bought myself uh a nissan sentra Mm -hmm. that was certified pre-owned for 10 grand and it was three years old yeah you can't do that now that's a thirty thousand dollar car absolutely right so fuck this i lived it you're gonna have a car loan this day and age right you're gonna have a mortgage right So if you want that really fancy car and you make $150,000 a year, you start saving now for the car. Yes. It sounds like it's more tackling the want with intention again. Correct. Right. It's be conscious. Like it's to, it's to sit there and say, okay, this is the thing I have to do three years from now. Let me start tackling it now. Let me not sacrifice that three, what I want three years from now today, Mm -hmm. but let me not sacrifice three years from now also i need to i need to have both Mm -hmm. and most people just live with i work and i buy i work and i buy it's sense gratification after sense gratification after sense gratification i work i'm unhappy i buy i'm happy i work Mm -hmm. i'm happy and neither is the goal do you know is there a good way to satiate that instant gratification get addicted to savings 
<laughs> it's a, no, I mean, it's like. I actually think that was kind of a good answer because it's like when you have the thing that you want, like you can save for it. And that feels good in a way. It, it, it's, it's like, yes, the goal of life, according to spirituality, is to lo- no longer have sense gratification be mm-hmm. the monk to be the hermit right to be able to not need anything to be a priest yeah that's the goal like according to every sacred text yeah what's well, the best i'm going to be like that right right so you have to ask yourself what are the award- rewards that you can afford today what are the rewards that you need to save for tomorrow and what are the things that you need to do in order to have a fulfilled life 10 years 20 years 30 years from now also yeah and you have to, you know, you have to develop that delayed sense of gratification. Mm-hmm. That's one of the keys to success in life is to move away from instant to delayed gratification because the most successful people are people that have delayed sense of gratification. And they did a study on it. It's this famous study where they took these people in the 1970s, these little kids, and they put them in a room and the uh, the lab technicians put a marshmallow in front of the kid and said, you can have this mu- this marshmallow now, or you can wait five minutes and I'll give you two marshmallows, mm-hmm. right? And the technician left the room and the kid, would eat, either the kid would eat the marshmallow or the kid would wait and get two marshmallows. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the study. The study was tracking them 20 years from now. Oh, okay. Right? And the kids that waited and had for the second marshmallow were anywhere from 20 to 30% more successful from the kids that ate the marshmallow right away. Oh my God. So do you think that that's like a, just the way you are thing? I feel no, like everything in life that. is taught. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're skill based, we're skills based humans. Yeah. We're, most people are born with a little bit of talent, right? There's the, the difference between a major league baseball player and me is a certain level of talent. I'm never going to be able to throw the ball 90 miles an hour. All right. <laughs> yeah. But I can play high school b- baseball or college baseball through skills, through practice, through effort. Right. I'm never going to be a savant musician. Never go, but I can learn how to play the guitar. Yeah. Right. Everything in life we do is based on skills. We learn them. We mm-hmm. learn the late sense of gratification. Or we and or we learn instant gratification. Mm-hmm. In order to be successful in life, we have to develop a delayed sense of gratification. Right? That doesn't mean that we don't have any pleasure today. Like, yeah. Right? Like a good piece of chocolate, a nice dinner on a Friday night. But in order to have that really nice vacation to, that we want to go on, we have to save money for it so we don't accumulate debt. Right? Yeah. The second is perseverance, to be able to push through hard times. Right. That when shit hits the fan, because everybody has a certain amount of hardship in the year and everybody has a certain amount of uh, blessings, it's to be able to push through when it's hard. Mm-hmm. Third is adaptability, to, the ability to be able to change, the ability to, to look at the world and say, OK, what I'm doing isn't working. I need to change in order to succeed. Mm-hmm. So many people suffer because they aren't adaptable, right? That's why pe- the people are conservative, right? The world was better when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. The world was better when you were a kid because the world was aligned with you, who you were as a kid, because you were, you were growing, but at some point in your life, you stopped evolving. And that's why you no longer think the world is great. Change. Yes. Yes. Right. Adaptability. Those are the things that lead us to succeed. And then, and that's the, the secret to success, mm-hmm. perseverance, adaptability, and delayed sense of gratification. Okay. I was actually going to ask you that question. What were the three things that people need to learn? And you just answered it for me. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah. That kind of like makes me take a deep breath because I feel like when you have the three things and like have three things to focus on, it makes it easier that you're kind of like, okay, I can pay attention. I need to adapt in this situation. Something changed in my life, freaked me out. I don't like this anymore. I need, but it is what it is. I'm on the plane anyways to London. I got to just ride it out and adapt with it. Got to persevere. You got to get there and figure it out once you do. And you have to Amen. have a delayed gratification. It's good. COVID was the perfect example for me as a person during that mm-hmm. period, right? When COVID, when COVID hit, 
I remember like March 15th, my, I was running, I had a fully sold out yoga teacher training. I had mm -hmm. 12 students signed up. I was selling a retreat to Costa Rica and I was making a good living doing some coaching at some wellness centers and some corporate places and teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. I was doing great. I woke up on March 16th and everything was gone overnight. And I wasn't working for a, a company that said, wow, you can go, you're going to work from home to, now and, and have an income. My entire income went from making $6,000 to $7,000 a, a month to zero in 24 hours. That's insane. Right? Yeah. Within 24 hours, I lost yeah. everything. Yep. Yeah. Right. And I was very lucky because for the first time in this lifetime, we were able to collect unemployment and I had savings. Mm -hmm. I had money in the bank. So the first month I just was like, all right, I have savings. I have credit cards with no balances. I'm fine. And then mm -hmm. I was able to correct, collect unemployment. Mm -hmm. And I did exactly what you're supposed to do when you're collecting unemployment. I didn't do what everybody else did. Went to the beach, party, bought cars, drank, learned how to bake bread. I went, I'm going to go do something with this. Mm -hmm. And so I built a business. Mm -hmm. and I built an online coaching business. Yeah. Right. And that was me adapting to a different way of earning a living, pushing through the hard times. Mm -hmm. And that's that was this. And then wait, knowing that if I kept doing this, eventually I would get to a place where I no longer have to commute. Yes. Yes. Thinking and that was long the delayed, term. Right. And that was my delayed sense of gratification. I went through it. It was hard. Yeah. Everybody else was hanging out and drinking and I was in my room working. Yeah. Right. But now look at you. <laughs> now you've got a whole business and people are still facing the repercussions of, of the pandemic and the mental health crisis, of the pandemic. It's really people. I, I tell people all the time. I'm like, you forget COVID was still going on last year, this time, this time last year, you still had to wear a mask to go to most restaurants. Yeah. All right. That, that, that was still a thing. People don't remember. We have this, like, we're, we're goldfish fish, like humans by nature are goldfish. Mm -hmm. We only remember what's in front of us and we forget everything. Yeah, absolutely. What is a toxic trait that you've overcome? <laughs> which one <laughs> yeah I, well, look, I mean like look part of the reason what led me to this journey of personal growth was i was a functional drug addict in my 30s okay uh you know i i lived in new york city um so i'm 16 years ago i lived in new york city this was before the opiate crisis right yeah. that everybody knew about mm -hmm. i had a prescription i had i saw six doctors a month i had one doctor give me a prescription for my back i get in Mm -hmm. I had another doctor give me a prescription for Percocets for my back. I had mm -hmm. another doctor give me a prescription for my anxiety, Xanax. Mm -hmm. I had three doctors prescribe me Ritalin, Adderall, and Focalin. Yep. Right? And every day I'd wake up in the morning and I would crush a line of Ritalin or Adderall or Focalin and throw it up my nose. And I would walk into my office and my sweet mate would be crushing up a line of Adderall and saying, good morning, Michael. <laughs> bumping a lot of bumping a lot in the office yeah so it was no big deal and then i would do it again at noon and yeah. then at two then at four then at six then at eight then i would either go home or i'd go out to dinner and then i would take Z xanax for my anxiety and v valium or percocets for my back and, but that was all for me to go to sleep mm -hmm. and i yeah. did this for years yeah years I like how you say you're a functional drug addict because I think no people, one knew. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the thing is that like people think like, oh, well, I'm not a drug addict because my life isn't in the shitter. And it's like, <laughs> it's because you're just still operating doesn't make it any better. Still doing it. When I, when my, my one mentor called me up one day and said, Hey, how you doing? What's been going on? I'm like, oh, I just, and I was like, I just got a, uh, interviewed on the drug and alcohol addiction podcast. And he was like, why were you on that podcast? I'm like, because I was a drug addict, an alcoholic. And he's like, what? <laughs> I thought you didn't drink. I was like, oh, no, I did. You just mm -hmm. didn't know about it. Oh, yeah. And I was on drugs for the two years that I was, you were mentoring me. But you just didn't know about it because I kept it all a secret. Yeah. Because I still held a job and I still went to the gym mm -hmm. and I still exercised. I just was doing it all through, through drugs and alcohol to numb out the pain yeah. of my life. Yeah. And it was, the you know, I had to 
do a lot of hard work. I had to look myself in the mirror and see the person looking back at me. And I didn't like that person. Yeah. And I had to be, com- I had to learn to be comfortable with my thoughts, to be comfortable with silence, mm-hmm. to walk into my house and not immediately go turn on the TV. So I can, so I, cause if I, when I turned on the TV, my mind would start racing yeah. with all the things I didn't like about my life. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time to be able to be comfortable with silence. It took me a long time to be able to look in the mirror and be like, I like that person looking back. Yeah. And I did that through meditation, yoga, therapy, coaching, journaling, and every other tool under the sun that I can get my hands on. Yeah. Awesome. What's one you're still working on? I think for me, the big struggle I have is I I constantly am looking for a community to join and feel like I don't have a community. And because of that, I have a tendency to overextend myself instead of just being content with where I'm at right now because and recognizing that I barely have enough time for the few friends that I do have. Why am I constantly feeling the need to find more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have a closing game for you. Oh, quick, no. Quick questions. It's kind of toxic, kind of well. Ah. Ooh. <laughs> okay. What or who are you jealous of? <laughs> I'm jealous of anybody who's doing more than me in this world. It is part of my human nature that drove me. So if I see a life coach that's doing a public speaking event, I'm jealous of them. If I see someone sell a course that I want to sell, I'm jealous of them. I'm constantly jealous of people. It makes me competitive, but it's toxic. So okay. I send gratitude as a way to combat that. Okay, got it. When is the last time you people pleased instead of doing or saying what you really wanted? All the time. I mean, I try not to, but yeah. you know, I have parents that, you know, at times that I do things for them because it makes them happy. And I know I don't want to do it, but I do it for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really good about it not doing it with friends. And I'm really good about not doing it with my wife because my wife and I are always motivated to work on ourselves. But sometimes with my parents, I do it. Mm-hmm. When are you selfish? Every day. I wake up every day with the mindset that I come first. Yes. Amen. I like that. How do you practice it? I wake up every day and say to myself, I come first. <laughs> yes. And then That's I awesome. ask myself if what I am doing is serving me. Mm-hmm. And then my wife comes second. Mm-hmm. Then my coaching business comes third because I need that to pay for my life. And then everything else comes after that. Love it. I love it. What do you find yourself overthinking about? The next stage of my career, trying to build a business, leveling up. My plan is to take uh, Amy Porterfield's Digital Course Academy this fall because I really want to learn how to sell a course and do it right. Did it once before and I got crickets. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to try to this course and hopefully it will work this time because there's only so many Michael and there's so much Michael in a day. So I'm pretty much at the height of how much I can earn in Mm -hmm. terms of private coaching. And the only way for me to scale is either do public speaking, which I have no desire to travel and do that. Mm-hmm. So I want to sell a course and build a membership site. Sweet. And I constantly am thinking about that and overthinking it. Sweet. What are you picky about? I don't know. Close. Kind <laughs> of. Nah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really know what I'm picky about. My wife would tell, know that answer. I don't know. <laughs> What makes you quick to get angry? Oh, so I have ADHD. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not ADHD like modern. I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was two years old or in, excuse me, second grade in the 1980s, right? So I don't, I don't produce enough glycosamine in my brain. So I get easily distracted at times, okay. which can lead to emotional imbalances, which can lead me to get angry. So okay. I don't have enough sleep and I'm not eating right. And I'm not taking my supplements like Alpha Brain and Lion's Mane and Ashwagandha, I can get angry very easily and real and not control it. Like mm-hmm. I see myself on autopilot reacting. Okay. Right? So as a result, my wife and I have a word that if I start to get overwhelmed and, and my wife will call it a meltdown or <laughs> she'll say swaha. And that means go shut the fuck up, go outside, take a walk, get some. And it's, and I real and ask myself why I'm overreacting. Yeah. Cool. What are you afraid of? 
I'm not afraid of dying. I think everybody, I, I'm, not, I'm afraid that I'm going to be 75 years old and be uh, a greeter at a grocery store and not be able to live a full life when I'm 75 years old. That's my yes. fear. Okay. What do you have? Um, sorry. What do you not have empathy for? The one I don't want to say out loud because I'll piss people off. I, I don't have empathy for people who are who are toxic and aren't willing to do anything about it. Yes. Yes. I like it. If you could give one piece of advice to someone trying to become more well than toxic, what would it be? Be comfortable with silence. Learn like to it. be with your thoughts. Because like they're not it. going away. And if you ignore them, they're still there. Mm -hmm. And no amount of drugs... No amount of weapons of mass distraction are going to get rid of those thoughts. So whatever you need to do, whether it's meditation, journaling, seeing a life coach or a therapist, or going on a retreat, you need to learn to be comfortable with that silence. Mm -hmm. Amen. Where can people find you? Oh, just go to my website, elevatelifeproject.com. All my stuff's there, podcast, YouTube, blog, and signing up for my newsletter or just getting in touch with me. Perfect. I'm going to link it down below too. So people can get in touch with you that way. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I have appreciated everything that you say. You provide such good wisdom. Thank you. I love doing this. So thank you. And you know, anytime, anywhere, if you need anything from me, just tell, text me, email, call me. Yeah.